Jacqueline, could you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Aline. I recently actually graduated in June with a mechanical engineering degree. I did the engineering internship in Barcelona. Um, we were placed all in separate programs. So I was placed with Universidad Pampa Fabra, um, where I did um, more biomedical application. And prior to graduating, I was a project manager for Baja Racing uh, for about a year. And I was also part of ESC and the student committee. Yeah, thank you, Yulin. And mm -hmm. another panelist with us today is Elmer. Could you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Elmer. I'm currently a fifth year biomedical engineering student here at UCI. And I recently came back from studying abroad from Norway, like this past fall quarter, fall semester. And I've just, I'm here in my time at UCI. I've done mostly like undergraduate research projects. And I'm also involved in CAMP and OAI. Yep. Thank you, Elmer. So yeah, Elin and Elmer will be answering some of the questions I'll be asking them and sharing some of their experience abroad to give you some ideas. So yeah, thank you guys. So yeah, before we get on with the presentation, if you go to the next slide, you, um, just a quick poll um, with your imaginary hands or using the reactions. How many of you guys have considered studying abroad? Show your hands by using a reaction. Awesome. Seeing the numbers rise. Awesome. Cool. I expect a high number just because you guys are here. So yeah. And if you guys have considered studying abroad, where? Write your answers in the chat. Singapore. Nice. South America. Korea, Japan. Nice. Nice. Belgium. Barcelona, Paris, Spain, Singapore. Nice. Good variety, love to see it. Awesome, yeah. So hopefully um, with those in mind, hopefully this presentation will give you an idea on the process of studying abroad for engineers and yeah. So with that, let's get started. Yeah, so first question probably on your minds is what is study abroad? So I guess before I begin with that, just like, at, just like here at UCI, you have many options you can do here at UCI, extracurriculars, clubs, organizations, anything to make your life a little less stressful from engineering courses. Um, here's one, study abroad. What it basically is, is you're practically living and learning in a different country that's outside the United States, where you can be earning credit towards your degree progression, as well as gain valuable skills for your future. So towards your future career or just your future life in general. So yeah, that's like the basic overview of study abroad in its simplest form. Um, next, please. So probably another question you guys have is why should you go study abroad? So there are many benefits to studying abroad, academically, professionally, and personal. Here are just some few examples. You can take classes at UCI, I'm sorry, you can take courses abroad that are not usually offered at UCI. An example that comes to my mind immediately is there is a class one student has taken on Italian Mafia, which we obviously don't have a class on Italian Mafia here. And you get a different perspective as well. Um, you can engage in active learning in a new setting. So in your guys' case, you can take engineering courses and get an engineering perspective from a different perspective, like not necessarily from UCI's perspective. Um, you'll also be able to meet friends and make lifelong friendships from all over the world. So yeah, you have a... So that would further build your connections, hopefully add some LinkedIn connections as well. Um, and also develop problem solving, multicultural communication skills, basically communicate. You can try working on a new language or learn a new language and communicate with other things. And here are some other um, benefits that are listed here, but really like the list for benefits can really go beyond this. And it's really a matter of a personal preference too. So with that, um, I would like to turn to our panelists. Um, I would like to ask you guys, um, please share a few benefits that you earned or gained from studying abroad. And if you have any stor stories associated with them. So Elin, can we start with you? Sure, of course. 
Um, one thing that stands out to me, like you mentioned, the making the lifelong friendships and building that global network is so important. When I did my internship, it was through a UC Davis program, uh, and a lot of uh, it was open to a lot of other UCs. So I got to meet people uh, from different UCs, not just UCI. So I was making friends from everywhere and. Um, and just building that global network, I still keep in touch with the PhD students that I was doing my internship with in Spain. So um, I'm always seeing what they're up to, and that just really helps build that network. And in terms of some other benefits, um, this internship really opened up a whole different field for me. Since I was mechanical, I never really thought about uh, joining the medical field. Um, but since I did that internship, I was open to that field, and now I have a full-time job in that field as well. So in that terms of exploring different fields, it's very beneficial. That's really awesome, Elin. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And Elmer, do you have any? Yeah, just to add on to what she said, like, I have made lifelong friendships so in my study abroad program, it's very common for European students to go to Norway in order to uh, practice their English or become better at it. And I would say that's like how I made most of my friends because they would always like want to, I would say, hang out with me just to practice their English. And then as well as we were all students, like just taking similar coursework and we're all new to this very like foreign country. And I would also say regarding classwork, I took all my GEs abroad, so I didn't take any engineering classes, and it just gave me both insight on like the humanities field as well as like what I would say what it's like like living in the, another country as well. And this this what has been like really helpful for me, especially during interviews, because it's something that I always reference like. Yeah, when they ask, like, when, yeah, so I have, like, study abroad in my resume, but they ask, like, what I studied at, and they always, like, are interested in, like, the fact that I studied in the School of Humanities, and it just, like, gives, I would say it just, like, helps me explain to them how, like, besides, like, like, it was a good learning experience, but overall, like, it's just proof that I really want to do engineering more. Yeah, awesome. That's very impressive. Thank you, Elmer. But yeah, um, thank you guys for your input. Now, moving on. So now that you know all that, um, what program providers, what options do we offer here at the UCI Study Abroad Center? So we primarily right now have three, hopefully four in the future, but I'll get to that. So the first option, the most popular option is UCAP, um, the same name that Elmer did. Um, you may have heard this name being thrown around a lot, but it's basically the UC system-wide office that provides programs for not just UCI students, but for all UC students. So like what Elmer said, if you take part in a UCAP program, you may be um, taking classes with other UC students, such as from Berkeley, Riverside, Davis, so forth. The next category is other UC programs. Um, these are basically programs offered by uh, the study abroad centers of other UCs, um, such as Davis as displayed there, like the one that Elin did. Berkeley also offers some programs as well, and some of the other UCs have also had some programs as well. And then the last category is the independent programs. As the name suggests, these are programs provided by providers not really affiliated with UC or UCI. These would normally be the choice if, say, the country you want to go to or city you want to go to is not offered through UCAP or another UC program. So yeah, those are our main three options as of right now. Uh, we're currently working on programs um, under the category of UCI programs. Those would be programs led by us here, the UCI Study Broad Center and some faculty here as well. But we currently don't have any, so stay tuned if you're gonna be around at UCI for a while. Right, so study broad options, so now that you have those program options in mind, what can you do abroad? So as some of our panelists has pointed out, you can obviously take courses abroad. Um, you can take engineering courses, obviously. Um, 
as well as upper division, lower divisions. In addition to that, you can also do minor in GEs or take cultural language classes if you want to learn about a new culture or learn a new language, respectively. You also, for some programs, you may be given the option to do internships as well. So either for credit, paid, unpaid, so forth. Um, normally, that's a discussion more with the advisors once you meet them, if you do apply. You're also given a choice to do research for specific programs, um, as well as volunteer and stuff like that, yeah. And as far as most programs that we offer here, most programs are not competitive, as in like they'll take as many people as that are qualified in terms of GPA and class level and some of the prerequisites. But just keep in mind that there are some that are also limited capacity as well, which means they'll only take a certain number of people based on first come, first serve. And where can you go? Um, basically all around the world. And article may be a little limited, but hopefully in the future. Um, and then when? So literally almost any season of the year. Um, fall, winter, and the full years tend to be a little more popular because they're during the academic year. And for other reasons, I'll explain in a bit. Um, but in terms of how long you can go abroad, you can usually go abroad as short as eight weeks as as short as eight weeks during the summer or to a full year. Um, but from the advising that I've seen, generally engineering majors benefit more from summer or full year options. But yeah, it how one's perfect for you, it really depends on the person itself. Yeah. Next, please. Can, can I add some uh, things for this slide as well? Yeah, for sure. Go Since ahead. there was such good information about this, um, regarding the um, uh, how long and all of those and, and the competitive process. So for some uh, internships, uh, specifically from the UC Davis program, they do have limited spaces available. And um, they, they accept applications. That application process can be a little long. Um, so those ones, they open about six or seven months prior to going abroad. So those ones you should keep an eye out earlier. But compared to the UCAP ones that I'm familiar with, the ones that are just um, studying abroad for a semester or for, for a quarter or so, those ones, typically the application process is much easier and shorter and there's no set deadline and spots. I think maybe Elmer can confirm on the the. UCAP study abroad ones, but for the internships and research ones specifically, there are limited spaces available. Yeah, yeah, so I just remember, yeah, UCAPs, I mean, some programs have like limited capacity, but UCAP like has that information on the website and other programs like they just take basically anyone that wants to become part of the program. And regarding deadlines, most, I remember most engineering programs will be towards the end of December and other programs will be like second week of January. That would be the deadline. Yeah, and keep in mind for some of them, like the internship ones, there is a long process because they do try to find specific companies for you and they might do some interviews and each company might interview you as well so that process might be a little longer than just the studying abroad ones yeah for sure thank you guys thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I do see some questions in the chat right now I forgot to mention in the beginning there will be a Q&A session towards the end so feel free to save your questions towards the end for me or any of the panelists so yeah so yeah some notable programs here for engineering, I should note, these are just a sample of the ones I have seen um, thrown in and out when I was advising. So these universities I've listed for UCAP um, are some of the ones I've seen the most students apply for. Um, and also generally, um, yeah, they're generally the most applied I've seen for UCAP. So this includes Lund, um, Edinburgh, Tohoku, and STEM research in Osaka or Tokyo as well. Um, for other UC programs, the program that Elin did is specified there. That seems to be a pretty popular program that I've seen around as well. And yeah, so these five are listed here and then there's more. So if you want to sum up everything that is offered for engineering, I don't even know the exact number. So yeah, there's a lot for us out there. And yeah, next please. So yeah, probably the next question when you're probably going to be abroad or applying for abroad is housing. So generally housing varies by program, 
Um, some may be organized by the program themselves, or it may be self-arranged as in the program provider will provide you resources on how to find housing within the university or within the city. Some examples of housing types I've seen are dorms, apartments, or even homestays where you'll stay with a host family somewhere in the city or in the local country. So yeah, it's, so housing wise, it really depends on the program itself. And yeah, for extras, what can you do outside of academics? Literally a lot. So you can do volunteer, travel around, explore neighboring countries, join a club organization, play a sport you haven't played before. Yeah, so the, the options are endless. So now this is the part where I like to turn to our panelists again. So for both Elon and Elmer, could you share your housing experience as well as if you did any activities outside of academics? So yeah, Elin, starting with you again. Sure. Um, but in terms of housing, um, I was lucky enough that my program placed um, everyone in the program into this student hotel. So that just when everyone's living together in one place, um, it's so much more convenient. You get to plan things, you get to go everywhere together and um, and you just build connections better. Because I know some other programs, everyone was scattered everywhere and they were doing homestays, like you said, um, or apartments. So uh, just always keep in mind when you're looking at the housing situation per program. And in terms of extras, my program um, had planned a couple field trips and they were having weekly activities like yoga and yoga in the park. Uh, I did a flamenco dance class and those were limited spots, but available, but um, just joining all of those um, and having an open mind uh, really helps. We did, uh, we played volleyball at the beach and um, and just anything like that. We also, in terms of extras on the weekends, uh, we, as a group, we planned to travel to different cities together. So that was also a really good experience. Yeah, yeah thank so, you. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, go ahead, Elmer. Sorry. So regarding housing, I also lived like, oh, I, it, I would say it has the same setup as like how UCI and ACC are. So like the the University of Oslo or the university I studied at has their own, I would say housing options, like how UCI has VDC, VDCN. And the I would say the village that I went to was called Song, and that's where all the international students like lived at. So it's like a small community like within the international students where like yeah, it's very convenient just to see, like, see, like, where everyone, like, that's like walking around the village, for example, like, you know, everyone's new to this country, and sometimes you see people that you've met before. So there's a, uh, and just easy to strike up a conversation or plan some things like in advance, like traveling, for example, I remember like planning trips with my other friends as well. And regarding the club, I also joined the, the photography club as well. So it was just meeting other students that had similar interests as myself, uh, exploring, taking photos of the city or doing photo walks. And yeah, that's about it regarding housing and extras that I've done. Yeah, thank you, you too. Yeah, there's definitely a lot you can do outside of academics. So be sure to take advantage of that while you're abroad. But yeah, next please. So yeah. Um, probably the next major question in mind with study abroad is how much does it cost? Because unfortunately, nothing is free. Um, so in terms of finances, tuition to go abroad is generally around or less than UCI tuition. We have a quick ex example here listed on this table for Yonsei Korea, one of our more, more popular programs. So as you can see on the left there, that's how much it costs for in-state tuition for an uh, in-state student, I'm sorry, for a whole year abroad, at, a whole year at UCI. And on the right there is, um, on the top right, is how much it costs to go abroad to Korea for a full year. And then below that is how much it costs for spending fall quarter at UCI and then the spring semester at Korea. So as you can see in that example, it's actually generally cheaper to go to Korea than go to UCI abroad. So, but then again, tuition does depend on the country itself. So um, be sure to check on that as well when you're applying. And thankfully, um, if you're a financial aid recipient, financial aid does come with you if you partake in a UCAP program or an other UC program. 
And it does adjust to the cost of the program. So like, for example, if say 80% of your tuition is covered um, here at UCI, the same 80% will follow you abroad. And we also have scholarships available. So be sure to check out our scholarships page for any more information on scholarships provided by UCAP, um, UCI ourselves, or any other platforms as well. There's generally more scholarships and financial aid during the academic year. Um, and yeah, that's just because summer generally we follow the rule, the financial aid for summer generally follows the same rules as UCI summer session. So there's that. So this is another time where I'll turn to our panelists again, where could you guys explain how you guys financed your programs and how you went abroad as well as, I guess, like how you, how, what you spent on like during while you're abroad as well. So yeah, back to you, Elin. Yeah, so this was one of the main concerns when I wanted to study abroad, especially when I had already completed my degree in every requirement, but I was just, I just wanted the study abroad experience that I didn't get. So I actually did my study, my internship the summer after I graduated. So just keep in mind the year you're on and the requirements you need, because if you've completed all your requirements, financial aid really doesn't apply to you. So the only thing you can rely on are scholarships. So if you are uh, planning on studying abroad or traveling, um, just keep in mind to do it before you finish your grad requirements. And um, in terms of scholarships, for example, when I did the Davis program, and I applied for scholarship for the UCEAP, it didn't really apply. So just always read the fine print and make sure that the scholarship you're applying for would apply uh, directly to your program. And uh, in terms of other finances, I mainly use my savings um, and help of my parents to pay for the uh, program since they are a little pricey. But um, And in terms of spending money there, I would say just budget, but still, um, I wasn't too strict on myself when planning weekend trips, for example, um, because I knew I would just that money would come back, but the memories wouldn't. So I I just set aside some money for the eight weeks that I was there. Yeah, fair points. Thank you, and mm -hmm. Elmer. No, yeah. First off, excellent point. <laughs> yeah, the memories like will always stay, and so. I'm a financial aid recipient. So, I mean, basically, yeah, I was surprised that when my financial aid like co covered almost everything regarding my program experience. But like as she mentioned, like you have to make sure that you were doing like classes towards your major. And like engineering students too, or I talked with the financial aid office like before studying abroad, this only counts for like yeah, just major like engineering classes. Financial aid doesn't count for your GEs. So what I did was I, yeah, I made sure to have some classes, I would say leftover from my, my major classes and practically just, I, I do that after my study abroad experience. And just to add on more with like my financial aid, since I knew that Norway was like a really expensive country. Yeah. And that's another thing to do your research beforehand on like, I guess, how expensive like other countries are, or like what are like how much other students spend there well, because that, that really does come into play. But yeah, just Norway like was was very expensive. I I did my research on that and I was fortunate to like being able to receive be able to receive scholarships like that I that that I applied to and then just explaining like how much like money is also worrying to and then and then as well as I would say with financial aid too sometimes like you're able to ask for them like for more support as well but that just comes on a case-by-case -case basis that I'm aware yeah thank you Elmer thank you too so yeah next please yeah, and of course, um, with any um study abroad assessment or study abroad trips, we want you guys to be safe and healthy. So in that regard, we do do assessment of risks on countries before anyone goes abroad. We do have a global risk manager on site. His name is Mark Byrne. So he basically monitors activity in each country. Sorry about that. 
he monitors he monitors activity in each country that students take part in. And basically, you can say he's the final green light before anyone's allowed to go abroad. So he gives the final clearance. And then before every student um, goes abroad, they're required to do pre-departure preparation and as well as an approval as well. So in if you do the application process, there is a section that will ask for, like, are you aware of um, what is the risk level issued by the U.S. Department of State, as well as um, anything you should be know aware of as well while in this particular country. And yeah, in regards to because we recently had a pandemic in the past few years with the COVID-19 pandemic, students will be informed about any preparation they need to go before they go travel. Like, do they need any specific documents to enter the country? Any specific form you should fill out, say, 24 hours or 72 hours before departure? Stuff like that, basically. And programs will all, we will also notify students if pro, if in the unfortunate case a program is canceled due to COVID-19 or anything um, health related, if that's the best of course option. But of course, we will work with students to find alternatives as well, because we want you guys to go abroad as well. But yeah, and so this is another question for our panelists again. Could you guys share your like any like health and safety experiences as well as if you guys had any like culture shock or well, if you guys had any support while you guys were abroad as well, or any methods of coping yourselves, making yourselves sane. So yeah, and then back to you. Yeah. So before even traveling during the application process, you're required to do a full, complete physical uh, check with your doctor. So um, they want to make sure you have all your vaccinations and everything that you need. Um, uh, the team on site and um, and the ones that are monitored from here are super helpful. If there's any issues with health and safety, they're really quick to contact and um, really easy to deal with. Uh, so they were always with you. So you never felt alone if anything happened. Um, and for COVID, it just varies with con with each country. Um, they would ask you sometimes to mask up during public transportation or anything like that. In terms of safety, I know, I don't know if you've heard that Barcelona is like the biggest pickpocketing uh, uh, city in Spain. So uh, they just had gone through everything that prepared us and made sure we were always aware of our surroundings. Um, there's They're very helpful with providing all the information you need. Uh, there's always presentations prior to going to abroad and they always have a website with all the information you need. So um, you never feel like you're lost or if you have any questions there's always someone on site to be there for you yeah thank you elin elmer yeah so she made a very excellent point too that i, I would have said so just i remember specifically regarding covid like i left like in the u.s like from the u.s when everyone was like wearing masks like in the gym or in public spaces but when i got to to norway or europe in general it was almost like as if like the pandemic never existed. So I just want like everyone to like be aware that sometimes like the way one country sees like health may be different from like how another country sees it. And I remember or you said the question too regarding culture shock, right? Ref? Yeah, if you could share any experiences regarding that, that'd be appreciated. Yeah, so regarding culture shock, like, I went in with the mentality that, like, I'm going to a new country, so, like, probably everyone, like, I mean, I'm probably going to be the only English speaker there, but it was, yeah, it was very shocking to me how when I went to Norway, like, practically, like, everyone, everyone knew English, like, everyone's, like, one from the people I chatted with there, like, everyone has been like practicing English for years. Like that's a requirement in Norway to like know really good English from school. And I would say too, oh, the weather also comes into play. <laughs> yeah, as well. Or for me personally, like just coming from like, let's say sunny California where, where it's always like, I would say when I left during the summer, it was like 80 degrees temperature. I got to Norway and it was it was pretty much the same, but I remember someone told me like to watch out for the winter depression. And it wasn't until winter where like things really started to change. So like the temperatures were reached like 25 degrees pretty much every day. It would be snowing every day. 
the sunrise would start like at 10 a.m. and the sunset would happen like at 3 p.m. So it's also like, yeah, that that really does come into play, just making sure, I guess, what type of climate or like, yeah, climate or weather you're going to be at. And yeah, that's that's about it. Yeah, thank you, Elmer. Definitely relate. I study in Germany where it was cloudy, cloudy, cloudy too. So yeah. All right, next, please. So now with all that in mind, what are your next steps? What should you do to do your first steps to go study abroad? So the first step would be to come to us, visit us at a study abroad office where me and my colleagues, we will be able to help assist you in finding a program or several programs if you have multiple in mind as well. And then with that in mind, once you found the program, you would be also finding classes that would contribute either to your degree progression, so major GE or minor classes, or just some classes that make um, are required to go make you graduate as well. Um, in terms of on the engineering side, there's a bit more steps to it, which I'll let Gio take over from here. Yeah, so um, the next step you want to take is make sure to complete your pre-departure packet um, and, of course, meet with the counselor. Um, so you want to make sure that the classes that you're going to be taking will be able to keep you on track to graduate when you want to graduate. Um, so that's definitely important steps to take in order to ensure that you're on the right path and taking the right classes abroad. Um, once you have your approval, that's when you'll go to the study abroad office and be able to apply to the specific program you want. And then at that point, once you're accepted, you'll start applying for scholarships, hope for some financial aid. And um, there's on your way. Thank you, Gio. Yeah. Now, the first step I say visit the study abroad office. So now, next question is probably where is that? Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So yeah. So where are we? So we're located at one one zero zero Student Services Second, the second, which is if you know where Zodding Go is, it's literally the building across or even the hill. Um, yeah, that's all the way on the other side of Ring Road from Engineering. But yeah, that's where we are. Um, we have emails. Um, if you want to contact us for any questions, there's our email address, studyabroad at uci.edu. So our current hours are from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Monday, Wednesday, Thursdays for in-person appointments. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, mouthful, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. for virtual appointments. And we also have walk-in advisons on Tuesdays where you can just walk in, show your ID, and one of us will be there to help you out as well. If you'd like to follow us on social media, we have Instagram at uci.abroad, where we'll be posting various things such as informational meetings or advice on, on applying, or as well as if you want any input from other um, returnees or peer advisors as well. So yeah, that's us. Uh, next, please. Yep. So yeah, here are a couple of QR codes to our website. Um, if you'd like to take a screenshot or a picture of these, feel free to do so. And as well as the right QR code, which is our contact us page, which is <clears throat> um, more information about who we are, um, where we're located again, basically the information on the previous slide. But yeah, thank you very much for your attention. And now I would like to open it up for the Q&A now. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or um, list them in the chat as well. Um, so I think I'll start with this first question listed by Timothy, where when will UCI programs be available? So that's a bit hard to say because we're still in the working process of them. One of the supervisors in my office is currently working on them right now. So we hope to get them as soon as possible, but be on the lookout for them. Unfortunately, I don't have an exact date. Sorry about that. Um, let's see. Thank you, Elin, for answering Lucas's question. Um, I'm, actually, the so, website that I linked uh, specifically for the Davis program, uh, if you go on it, you could see a bunch of different either study abroad or the internship abroad, research abroad, and uh, it, each page has the programs uh, per major, or, uh, just in general, and if the, you like the program, if you click on the program, it gives a bunch of details about the cost, living situation, any deadlines you have to meet, what courses uh, it applies to. So that one has a lot of information if you're looking to do the do the Davis program. Yep, thank you. I guess to add on for Lucas's question, how early in advance should you schedule a quarter to study abroad? So generally the rule of thumb to prepare for study abroad is a year in advance before you plan to go abroad. 
um, or at least two quarters. The reason for that is just so you have enough time to find classes and also apply for the program as well as if there's any like legal documentation that needs to be sorted out, you have all that time to deal with it. So yeah. So a question from Hussein. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Well, would the cost be different for current international students? Um, yeah, so the cost I just showed on the finances page, that would be for in-state students, so students who are studying from in-state. Um, there is a calculator on UCAP's website uh, for each program for um, based on like what kind of student are you, what year are you, and what country you're going to. So check out that calculator um, if you want a more personalized cost of your tuition for abroad as well. So yeah. Uh, Jimmy, how likely is it to find upper division classes abroad? So that would depend on the program. So I would say generally, um, because I took upper division classes abroad uh, when I was in Berlin, um, it would depend on the program itself. But my philosophy generally is if, say, a school is offering mechanical engineering degrees, they generally have to learn similar material to what we're learning. So I would say generally it's not too hard to find, but it is a bit of a process where you'll have to find courses there, like the course description, comparing the course description of the host university with the course description of the UCI courses. And also there may be some content like differences because they may teach one content, one concept in a different class, for example. Um, my recommendation is if there's a class that like everyone has to take or it's a very generalized topic, like I know for MAE majors, it's fluid mechanics, MAE 130A, 130B. Those kind of classes are generally like easier to find uh, because they're a bit more broad. Yeah. Just to add yeah. on to that, I know there are also thermodynamics classes being taught in terms of upper div. Yep, of course. So a question from Brian, is there an application fee? For UCAP and other UC programs, there is no application fee. Um, what is the process of petitioning courses to get credit? It's a question from Timothy. So yeah, for that, um, Gio, do you wanna answer that? Yes, so on our undergraduate uh, website, you can find forms that you can submit to petition for certain courses to get credit. Whoops, did she, did she cut out for you guys? Yeah, oh, she whoops. did. Oops, okay. Uh, hopefully Hi, she I can tag in um, while Geo is hopefully figuring out what's going on. I'm one of the academic counselors for the School of Engineering. Let me just turn on my camera. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet all of you. Um, so if you're interested in studying abroad, there are classes that you can take. And as Gio mentioned, there are ways that you can submit a petition on our website in the form section. And you can also contact your advisor as well. On our website, in the study abroad section of our website, we do have a pre-departure packet for you to fill out. So you can meet with a peer advisor or one of the academic counselors, and we will walk you through how to submit the form and um, where you can put this, like where you can link the syllabi for the courses. Just to add on, uh, since I did the internship and not the, those courses for study abroad, you can also get credit for the internship. There's specific courses uh, you can get six units of credit for, and theirs is a little bit different. Um, they will give you the information to fill out the forms to get those cred credits transferred as well. Yep. Thank you, Elin. Thank you, Ms. Wrong. Yep. Um, next question, Shiv. How difficult is it to get accepted into a study abroad program? So that does depend on the program, but for most of the programs, it's generally very, very rare that someone gets rejected. Um, most of the time, it's because they don't have the requirements, like the GPA requirement or the language prerequisite, if, this, if there is one to do the program. But yeah, so it depends on the program. The limited capacity programs um, for some countries like Korea comes to mind. They're generally a bit more competitive because they'll take us, they only take a certain number of people. So if you happen to do one of those programs, I do recommend um, applying as early as you can once the application is released. If the program you do choose is a limited capacity program, 
Um, I do like to say this when I'm advising. Um, I will say it's easier to get into a study abroad program than to get into UCI. Um, yeah, hopefully that helps, um, Shiv. Another question from Jimmy. For internship abroad, do you have to find housing on your own or do you work with EAP? So that depends on the program itself. So as I mentioned in the housing slide, some programs are self-arranged. So the program provider will give you some resources on how to find housing um, within the city or within the university itself. Um, but then for some programs, the program arranges it for you. So check out the program's um, housing description to see like what are they going to do with you for housing as well. So generally speaking, they'll, they won't leave you out in the open um, to look out for your own if it's an EAP program. So you're generally going to get some help with housing. So, yeah. To add on to that question, um, like Raphael said, it, it depends on the program. Uh, for the UC Davis internship one specifically, they cover the housing and you can get all that information in the website that I sent. Um, they'll be able to tell you exactly what, but mostly something that they don't cover usually, I don't know if the UCI programs do, is meals and meal plans. Uh, usually they just leave that up to you to figure out. Yeah, they don't cover, or for me, they they didn't like cover for meals. And yeah, they, that was one question I had before going. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you're just basically on your own for that. But it turns out to be a good experience in that way, because for me specifically, for our group, um, every day we would decide to try something new all together. So we would all make reservations and go as a group. So we didn't have any limitations in that way. So and they also um, they do provide you with a kitchen. For, from my experience, you can go grocery shopping and cook on your own as well. Yeah, for sure. Those are definitely good tips for meals and housing, et cetera. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then let's see here. Elmer provided a link for all the deadlines. And also there's will be a spreadsheet here. They're seeing, saying that if the program is a limited capacity or not. So yeah, thank you, Elmer. But yeah, um, I see that Lucas, you have your hand up. Do you have a question or was it just there from earlier? Oh, that's my bad. I got, I got, I'll put it down. No, no problem. Yeah. But yeah, any other questions? Feel free to drop them in the chat or unmute yourselves. One thing I want to mention also is before going, when I was considering it, considering studying abroad, I did always want to just reach out to past students who did that specific program uh, to just get their um idea on how it benefited them in the future and how they liked it. So I think that's very beneficial and that would definitely help you make a decision. So if anyone has questions about the UC Davis internship one that I did, feel free to reach out. I'll put my LinkedIn and I'll put my email in the chat as well. I'll be happy to answer any questions. There's a lot of things to mention that I wouldn't be able to put in this meeting, but feel free mm -hmm. to reach out. Yeah, thank you, Elin. On your note, I think there's a question for you um, from Jimmy. How many how people were in your group for the internship abroad or how many people went to the same trip? Um, I think that's a question mm -hmm. for you, Elin. Yes, so for the engineering internship specifically, there were two programs. There was a Japan one and then there was a, a Barcelona one. And since the Japan one got canceled, they did increase the space for the Barcelona one. So there were about, I wanna say 40 people, give or take. So. Um, 40 of us were sit staying in the same student hotel together uh, but in terms of traveling on the weekends we formed like smaller groups and uh, we would collaborate and bring um, and book trips together and just based on smaller groups but it was about 40 people yep. thank you I think another question for you you're quite popular yeah. for Davis Barcelona what was the Spanish course like that's a great question. So they do offer one week of a Spanish class and it's optional. You don't really get credit for it. You just get a certification, but it is one week. It's fast paced. It's about four hours a day. And that's after you do the internship. So the internship is daily. So you basically go to your job and then you go to your Spanish classes right after. So some people didn't want to enroll because it was just too much work. But I did the Spanish class. They do an interview to assess your level and then they place you in a group 
Um, I was placed in the top group because I had taken Spanish for four years in high school. Um, but it's very um it's it's a culture shock so when you go in it's other different students from all over the world that some of them might not know English so the only way you can communicate with everyone is through Spanish so it really challenges you to uh speak and I learned a lot from it just from those four or five days so I definitely recommend it yeah thank you Elin that's a good question any other questions um, through the chat or through the um, uh, meet yourselves? Let's see, more to Elmer. So a question for you, Elmer. To ensure financial aid carries through, can you clarify what you meant to leave some major courses before or after? Um, this is a question for you, Elmer. Yeah, certainly. So, I mean, for me, it was just like how you would enroll like at UCI. So let's say for me, it was technically just enrolling in only GEs and then enrolling in my engineering courses like for winter quarter. So it's pretty much that like you want to push or for me, I needed to push my engineering courses like towards the end of like winter quarter, spring quarter when I was going to come back from my from Norway. Like, does Thank that you. answer the question? I don't know. Uh, Rebecca, did that answer your question? Feel free to chat it to me or say something. Okay, yeah, that helped. Thank you, Elmer. Well, any other questions? Oh, can What's I it? add on where I could? Yeah, go. It? Yeah, yeah, so. Go I would say my experience was interesting because I was like basically taking non engineering classes. So regarding just making sure you're taking classes that count towards like your major or your GE requirements, you want to do that. I think with the school themselves, I don't know if I'm like, I don't know if someone could like fact check me, but there's also another option of, of doing that, like do your academic advisor or having your academic advisor I would say, I, I forget the term where like they, they approve like the classes you took. It's just in other words, like I took my, I mean, I took my GEs abroad, but I didn't get the pre-approval before I went. So I needed to like get them approved after I came back, which luckily I, they were approved to count towards my GE requirements, but, but yeah, you just want to be like aware that if you are taking GEs, then I think it's a whole different process. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, so another question from Tim, Timothy. If I go abroad to Spain, can I get credit for a Spanish minor? Yes, you can get credit for minor classes as well. But just know that um, I believe according to UCI Registrar, you cannot complete an entire minor abroad. So just make sure if you're planning to do minor classes abroad, you leave some here for UCI courses as well. But yeah, any other questions for today? Also, I wanted to emphasize that mm -hmm. if you want to take your courses at UCI, but you want that internship experience that would look really good on your resume and will have recruiters um, really interested in always asking questions. I think the internship options are really good because you get that real work experience as well and you you will be abroad. Uh, so if you're if you want to take your course at UCI but you want to do an internship abroad, I think doing that is a really good idea. Yep, uh, for definitely. the internship, though, uh, they don't get credit for a minor. The, specifically, the one I did, they don't. So there might be some other ones that have that. But for the internship, you just get credit for, I think it was research credit or just some class that uh, Davis offers. Yep, thank you. But yeah, for questions about credit, if it transfers, be sure to talk to the academic counselors as well and the peer advisors regarding how if the class transfers to engineering or not. But yeah, any last minute questions? We have five minutes remaining. Going once, going twice, and going three times. All righty, unit close. Now, before we close off, I just like to turn again to the panelists again. Any final thoughts? 
um, from either of you two, like any words of encouragement for the students here who are planning to go abroad? Yeah, Yilin, you can go on ahead. Um, just be open-minded and uh, try new things when you do or when you decide to go abroad. I know it might be intimidating sometimes when you're going alone, you have no, none of your friends joining you, but just know that everyone will be in the same boat as you and you can always make friends there with people in the program so you're not alone. Um, and you'll be making great memories with them as well. So don't shy away from that just because of that. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. You, Elmer? Yeah, I would just say to go for it. Like, you're going to meet so many, like, amazing people if you do study abroad and also learn about another country and the more, like, learn more about yourself as well. Like, it sounds cliche, but, like, I would say that's 100% true. <laughs> yeah, and then just making, like, yeah, just making, like, a lot of great memories. Like, I know for sure because of my study abroad program that I do want to go back to Europe, possibly study for a graduate program in Europe and work in Europe as well. So it, it's it, like, it will open your mind, like the experience. Yeah, like Elmer said, definitely changes your perspective on many different things. And if if you want to be on a budget, there's also these, um, they do a lot of free tours around major cities that you might be traveling to. So always just look at those free tours, sign up. I did one three hour one. It was great. So if you're always looking to learn and still may stay within your budget, those are really good options as well. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, you too. Yeah, definitely. It opens your perspectives and there's a lot out there outside of ECI. So yeah, I highly recommend it. But yeah, thank you guys for joining. And be sure if you have any more questions for Elin or Elmer specifically, feel free to reach out to them. Um, Elin's LinkedIn is in there and her email as well. And we also have a returning list and the peer advisors here in the office if you want to contact anyone else for any advice on studying abroad or anything else or just to help you out. But yeah, thank you very much, you guys, for joining today. Um, Gio, is there any final words? Um, no, thank you everyone for coming out. I'll also be sending out the recording um, for anyone who had to leave early and things like that. Um, so if you guys have any questions, Oops. Oh, no. did, she, did she cut out again? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, feel free to connect on my LinkedIn and I'm very responsive on that. You can always just direct message me if you don't want to write an email. Yeah, okay, yeah, for sure. Unfortunately, I think Gio is cutting out. So yeah. yeah, with that, feel free to contact any of us for any more information, as I said earlier. But yeah, thank you very much for coming and the recording will be out through engineering and yeah, have a nice day. Thank you. Hope to see you guys in the office. My okay. pleasure. Bye. Thanks, guys. Pleasure.